Welcome to this webinar series on getting started with the Exabyte AI platform. So before we start, I want to put some ground rules. Uh, the goal of this seminar is to help users understand the main concepts behind the Exabyte AI platform. We will speak about uh, the vision for the platform, what it can do today, and quick demonstrations of the features. This is the first webinar in the monthly recurring series. On the first Friday of the month, we will talk about getting started. And on the third Friday of the month, we speak about advanced topics. Every participant by now should be a registered Exabyte user to test and try this functionality that we'll be speaking about. And then every participant will receive this presentation in a PDF format, so there is no need to take any notes. All webinars are recorded and will be made available online. The information we are speaking about here is also contained at docs.exabyte.io. If you have questions at any point in time during the webinar, please use Zoom chat window to ask the questions. We'll have dedicated time to answer those questions during the presentation, but you can send them over um, whenever you want. All right. Okay, so here is the brief agenda for today. We will first speak about the platform overview uh, and its capabilities. And then we will proceed to understand the core parts, uh, like what is actually under the hood of the platform. We'll speak about the common user interface components and how to use them. Uh, things like accounts and service levels a little bit. And then we will proceed with a detailed description of materials and how to work with them, simulation workflows and calculation jobs. All right, let's start with the overview of the platform. What is the Exabyte platform? The view of the Exabyte platform really starts with um, the cloud as the focal point where multiple different kinds of simulation tools and um, multiple different kind of scientific work can come together. And that includes the computational scientists, the experimental scientists, the data scientists, and as well as, <clears throat> excuse me, folks like IT administration and R&D management. I believe that the cloud really is the focal point. It doesn't have to be a public cloud. It could be private cloud or any kind of on-premises cloud system. However, it has to be the point where all these different kinds of users communicate. And we believe that the only right way to deploy a modeling strategy is to have a combination of in-house commercial and open source tools built at multiple scales. And there has to be a data platform that accumulates the results coming from all these different tools to be able to facilitate machine learning and data analytics. So that's how we see the ideal scenario for deploying a modeling strategy, a digital R&D strategy. Now, of course, it also has to be secure. So how do we approach building such a platform? First of all, we start with um, the data standards. So we develop and maintain a set of open source components that together form the foundation of uh, this FAIR R&D ecosystem. And the FAIR term stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and repurposable. And so this data standards really are key to making this platform to be fair. And when we speak about the standards, we identify a certain set of entities like materials, simulation workflows, calculation jobs, and materials properties. And all of this are implemented in an object-oriented way um, as separated on purpose to improve modularity. Data structures for the entities are implemented in JSON schemas format, and they can be used in Python and JavaScript applications by um, utilizing some of the open source code that we have deployed today. Extractors also are a key component, and they are provided to help convert the data coming from other existing sources into the Exabyte format. So SC stands for Exabyte Source of Schemas and Examples, and that's what we refer to as the Exabyte Data Standard. We have examples for extractors for VASP and Quantum Espresso on GitHub as well. And lastly, the applications allow users to utilize the data formats and extractors to create and edit materials information. We have an example application for solid state materials design also available 
Now the Exabyte platform, as you see online, comes as a second component on top of this open source uh, development. We use the open source components to build the publicly accessible platform. And these components can be further licensed and deployed in a private scenario too, or whenever uh, people using it want to. <clears throat> we start with computational material scientists as the most well-known user scenario. And you can see here, they use the tools of their choice uh, bundled with extractors to produce information that is unstored in database and through the applications can be disseminated to a larger community of users. Okay. Now adding data scientists is key to build any kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning models. And that's what we support as of today as well. And we have future plans to add support for experimental scientists too. Today, they can also see the modeling insights, but as we go forward, we should be able to facilitate the collaboration between the three different kinds of scientists in a more uh, involved way. Finally, the external elements are also part of this ecosystem. And these external elements include the data platform for data scientists, like the tools that they deploy today <clears throat> on their computers or in-house within the organization that they work in. Laboratory equipment, of course, we do not provide it, but we can connect to it uh, with the right effort. And any kind of internal high-performance computing clusters that the computational scientists are deploying today. It can also be connected into the Exabyte platform. So if you think about the digital R&D cycle, we can identify seven components as shown on this slide. It starts from designing material structures, it proceeds to designing the modeling workflow and the logic for it. And then high performance computing infrastructure is important and then controlling and asserting the calculations and their completion, collecting the data, building data analytics and experimental validation. So seven components are shown here. And today the Exabyte platform supports six out of the seven. I will proceed to demonstrate to you how they work right now. So here is an example account page for Exabyte account within the platform. As you can see, we have multiple users inside the account. All, they, um, all of them can work with the entities like materials, workflows, and jobs. And they can see each other's work and collaborate and comment on each other's work to facilitate and make their work faster. We can also see a snapshot of the infrastructure available uh, to this account and some basic information about it over here. So when we look at step number one in the digital R&D cycle, we think about materials design. And here is a brief video where we can uh, uh, view how a surface is cut, a surface of aluminum gallium arsenide online. We can edit uh, the atomic structure directly here. You can see the, the atoms are being deleted. <clears throat> and once, we're, once we are done with the editing, we can store this information and tag it as supercell to be able to find it faster in the future. So attaching metadata is an example here. Now, when we're dealing with chemical reactions, we often want to have not just one structure, but a set of structures uh, bundled together. And here is how it looks in the platform today. So this is an example of chemical reaction coding. And here we can see different images from the initial to the final state of the chemical reaction. And on the right, we can see how the hydrogen atom is moving within the larger matrix. And these are different snapshots of the chemical reaction on the left. The second step would be to set up the simulation workflows. And for this, Again, we have a set of templates and a certain format that we use to represent the logic that is stored inside the simulation workflows. And here is how it looks today. So we can set up uh, and select one of the workflows. Here is the logic involved in the workflow. I will speak about it in more details a little later. And we can set up the computational parameters and send it over for execution into the cloud. Now, once we do that, we can see the progress of the simulation, uh, how different parts of the workflow are completed. And at the end, when the simulation is all finished, we will get the result. So this is an example band structure plot. 
as we deal with chemistry, for example, we can see the chemical reaction profile, the energy barriers, transition states, and uh, things like that. For people who work with this on a daily basis, <clears throat> excuse me, they usually prefer dealing with um, programmatic tools. And here is a quick example of how we can control the operations inside the platform from Python, from scripting. So here, what happens is that uh, materials are being imported. Just a demonstration, two materials are being important, imported from materials project, and then two calculations are created for these two materials. And then we wait for these calculations to complete. And at the end, when the calculations are complete, we use Python to set up a pandas data frame to extract the calculations information and form a data structure that can be further used uh, for some sort of artificial intelligence work. Okay, for building data analytics and machine learning approaches. <clears throat> the data analytics framework is also included as part of the uh, platform. We can run Jupyter notebooks on the platform using the data that has been generated from uh, the simulations. And here is a quick example. So we have um, a dedicated storage repository for all users and all accounts where we can go ahead and um, edit Jupyter Notebooks. In this case, uh, it's a simple example. So when you run it, we just get all materials that contain silicon inside the, the structure formula. So we can run this query and get as a result a list of all materials. Okay. So these are example capabilities as of today. We support a set of modeling applications as um, written in the slide. So <clears throat> different forms of access, including the main user interface, remote desktop, um, and command line environment. For Quantum Espresso and VASP, we have um, the main user interface developed to the best of our capabilities today. And then other applications we mostly support on the command line. And we also have analysis tools like EMG, Express Investor, and such to help people do the analysis and especially the 3G structural analysis uh, through remote desktop. And we support scripting applications, of course, like Shell and Python scripting. So accessing these modules on the command line is also possible. And here's the list of all available modules. And users familiar with um, any kind of supercomputing, high performance computing systems will be able to execute the calculations using batch scripting as well. Here is a quick example. We go online, uh, we open the web terminal, and then we can um, edit the batch script, set up the proper syntax, submit it for execution, and then see the results uh, once the execution of the calculation is complete. Okay, so here is a, a midway summary. Exabyte.io is a comprehensive ecosystem for materials and chemicals R&D. And the goal of this ecosystem is to transition the today's isolated or disconnected sealer approach to a fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable infrastructure instead. The goal is to supercharge computational scientists to accelerate the way that they do work and connect multiple different organizational units together. So people who do data science, people who do computational science and potentially information technology folks as well. Today, the computational material scientists for the most part <clears throat> are focused on delivering the insights because that's how they are evaluated. And thus they minimize any kind of time spent building software tools. So we believe that the best way forward is to have a company like us focusing on building the software and the computational scientists focusing on utilizing the software and adjusting and working with us to deliver specific materials insights. And that's the way that we can standardize the effort. That's the way that we can really organize the materials information to be able to deal uh, with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data-driven science in the future. So we serve as a flexible foundation. You can think about it as a SAP or Atlassian deployment that can be adopted by organizations that we work with. And 
delivered, deployed for a specific problem. And the platform can be accessed on multiple levels like your infrastructure or compute only, programmatic level, the RESTful API, and the web interface, of course. Okay, so next I'd like to speak about the core parts of the platform. And we'll start with the explaining what is under the hood. If you look at the picture that I demonstrated at the beginning, <clears throat> we'll see that there are multiple components and there are also their reflections on our GitHub page. So there are repositories that represent these data standards that represent the, um, the applications, the extractors, and all of them are available in the open source GitHub community. Now, what's important to understand about it is that we really focus on identifying the different entities that we work with, like materials, workflows, uh, jobs, and we separate them on purpose to improve the modularity and cover multiple different models and material types. And in many cases, when, <clears throat> excuse me, computational science is performed, the information about materials, information about the models are bundled together. And that kind of approach makes it very difficult to scale uh, the simulations beyond one certain kind of material. And that's why we on purpose separated these entities. And this work is still in progress, so the boundaries sometimes can be blurry, but the data structures are very well defined. And when we think about the data structures, we have to look at the repository called SE. And we have to look at the JavaScript object notation and JSON schemas. So again, this is an open source repository. It's reusable in Python and JavaScript projects. And we welcome the contributions beyond what we have already implemented them. So here's an example schema for a material. It has properties such as formula, unit cell formula, basis, lattice, uh, derived properties, some external information and such. If you look at basis, for example, inside itself it has coordinates, ID by the number, and the elements that um, fill in the crystal sides, the lattice sides in here. And of course, there's some additional information like information about the creator and when this material was created um, and things like that. So why is it important to understand uh, what's under the hood? It's important to understand it to be able to get the information that the platform uh, might not provide at this point. So if you look at the collection of materials uh, on the web and we expand the item, well, we'll be able to see this exact structure, the structure that I demonstrated on this previous slide. So this information can be extracted even if we don't, do not show some of it uh, in the entry. <clears throat> so every entity that user encounters inside the Exabyte platform is defined inside the Exabyte data convention and available online through GitHub. The definitions really are meant as a unified format to be able to incorporate data from multiple different material types, crystal, molecule, nanostructure, et cetera, in the future, and different modeling approaches like density functional theory, molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, et cetera. The platform today provides a user interface to work with the entities and gives alternative access options like command line and remote desktop and RESTful API. The last one is especially important when we speak about the data structures because most of the time it's a programmatic access engine. When we develop this open source parts, we uh, would like to encourage the contribution from community. So here's an example <clears throat> for a materials designer repository. And here's an example pull request on GitHub where a community have submitted certain changes for certain additional functionality. We encourage this type of approach and we will reward the people who um, help us develop the code in the future. Let's now go ahead and speak about the user interface and its main components a bit. So once you log in into the platform, you'll find out before main components of the general user interface. And those are the header, left-hand sidebar, the footer, and the right-hand sidebar. And of course, there is a support widget for any kind of questions to our support team. So let's start with that. Support widget is located in the bottom left corner. And here is how it looks. 
when you click on it. So when you su submit a support ticket, first of all, this is for the registered logged in users. And we really encourage people to explain and provide as much as possible context um, when they are submitting a support ticket. The best way to go is to include screencasts and screenshots because sometimes people complain and it's very difficult for us to understand the nature of the problem. With screencasts especially, it becomes much simpler. On the right, while you log in, there's also a second chat. And this is meant to help people who are still deciding about uh, registration to resolve any questions that they might have. So we discourage the use of it for regular users, for users who are already registered in the platform. Now, when you click, uh, excuse me, when you click on the top right corner, you can open the left-hand sidebar as shown here. And inside the sidebar, uh, there are short shortcuts to the entities that are created and are present for the account that you're currently using. For example, here I'm using the uh, per personal account for Team Exaplight user, and I can go to uh, their jobs, projects, materials, workflows, and such by clicking on the corresponding links. And here is how it's going to look like for this account. Materials, workflows, jobs, teams are all different tabs. On the right, so clicking on the name of the account opens the right-hand sidebar. And here are uh, shortcuts to the billing and payment information account preferences, as well as um, remote connection options like uh, the web terminal and the remote desktop. And there is some infrastructure with information too, and the ability to apply credit and add storage. The third important part of the interface are the entity-specific interface components. And we identify three different kinds. The number one is Explorer, or table or list component for exploring the entities stored inside the collection. So for example, when users have multiple materials, they can be viewed under the Explorer interface. And there is a designer interface that is an online development environment for the creation and editing of one or more entities. The viewer is a dedicated page allowing to visualize one or more entities and make small adjustments. So viewer is really not meant for any kind of editing. It just meant to get the information about an entry. So here is how an example explorer looks like. Again, this is a list of materials with some basic information about each one listed on the table. And the list has certain actions associated with it. Uh, we call the uh, actions that show up on the top tools and the actions that are pertaining to each of the entities are shown here in the dropdown. And by and large, these are the same actions. Sometimes the action doesn't apply to more than one entry. In that case, it's shown only in a dropdown. It's possible to narrow the items in the list by uh, filtering them here using this field. So if you type here uh, something like silicon, uh, the list will only show materials that have silicon in a name. The second kind of uh, entity-specific user interface uh, component is the entity designer. And here is an example of materials designer and its uh, layout. So at the top we have the header menu for the materials designer interface. We have the list of um, items available inside the designer on the left, crystallographic data component, and the interactive 3D viewer. Materials Designer is a standalone open source JavaScript application, so people who are willing to <clears throat> get under the hood can do that on GitHub. And here is the third example, the uh, materials viewer. As you can see here, we cannot edit the materials information but we can get, um, we can see what kind of lattice is used, what are the basis coordinates, and we can tag or adjust the metadata for this material. Change the name, for example, change the tags. Very quickly, 
uh, let's speak about the accounts and sharing as well. So now we have uh, the entities implemented in the beta structure. We have the UI components dealing with these entities. And the accounts really are the, the ones that perform actions on entities. Accounts define the different ways of how users can interact with the platform. So accounts have members. The users are members of the accounts. There are two types of accounts, organizational accounts or team accounts and personal accounts. Personal accounts only have one member, the person or the user themselves. And organizational and team accounts can have multiple members with different kind of permissions and um, privileges. All account members have shared access to entities as set by uh, the account administrators. We also have um, the notion of the entity collection and a bank collection. And to understand that, we have to look at um, this explanation. So entities are collected inside the platform in a way that each account has their independent entity separately. So when you first logged in into the platform, you may have found a single material and a single workflow that uh, your account was initiated with. It of course doesn't mean that we only have a single material and a single workflow on the whole platform. What it means is that the, the collection that is owned by your account at the moment when the account is created only has one item. However, we also have the bank collection that has unique items from every single other account. So bank collection is where we store all the unique items, unique entities. Exabyte ID property of the entity here corresponds to the unique ID inside the bank. So the ID inside the bank is translated into Exabyte ID property of the entity. Now there are private and public data access scenarios for the bank entities. For example, when there is an account with um, private data and a certain entity is created in the bank for that account, then no other account can have access to this entity. When the account does not have private data, the entity that is created in the bank is accessible by others. So when um, you'd like to import a bank entity, for example, you can use this import from bank action on the materials or workflow collection. And we suggest to use curator's account because um, that's the account that the administrators of the XY platform maintain and it usually has the highest quality tested workflows, for example, inside it. Okay, so if you'd like to have a, a template workflow for a band structure, band gap calculation, we suggest importing one that is owned by the curator's account. Let's speak a little bit about the service levels now. So service levels define the features that are available to accounts. And as you can see here, as a snapshot of different kinds of uh, service levels available, we do um, support free access to the platform. So we do not require our users to pay anything to just be able to access the platform and uh, utilize its capabilities. However, when uh, they like to run the computations, we suggest that they subscribe for one of the three service levels, pro, team, or enterprise. Pro is really meant for individual users. Team is really meant for small teams and enterprise meant for larger teams and uh, enterprise organizations. They have different uh, kind of fees associated with it and different features. For example, there are certain disk space allocated to each one. There are certain number of account members, um, how quickly we reply to support requests and the limits on the entities that they can work with. So let me summarize here about the core components. Again, at the very bottom of the platform, uh, at its very foundation, are the data standards and the entities. And the definitions are meant as a unified format that helps us incorporate additional simulation techniques, material types, and such. So we welcome a collaborative approach to developing uh, this unified format that people can reuse in their own projects. And that's the way we believe that the platform, the XY platform will grow in the future. 
we provide a user interface to work with those entities and RESTful API tools, as well as command line interface. The accounts can perform actions on the entities in a shared access way, allowing users to collaborate. And the features that are available to the accounts are defined by the current service levels from free to enterprise. Now let's see if we have any questions at this point. It doesn't seem so. Okay, no questions, let's proceed forward uh, with the rest of the explanation. Next, we'll speak about materials and I will demonstrate how we can perform certain actions on material entities. So initially people would start with uh, finding a way to upload the material information or create it inside the platform. And for that, we can use this upload tool in the toolbar of the Materials Explorer. So click on the upload tool and then click on select items to be able to select one or multiple structural information files from disk. So here we're using postcards, uh, files with .wasp extension, and we select them and they are being added into this list of uh, files to be uploaded. So this is a pre-upload dialog which contains all the files that are yet to be uploaded now. Now, why do we have this two-tier uh, system? That's because sometimes we want to uh, deal with multiple files and we want to add metadata to them. So here, I will demonstrate how to add metadata to one of these files. So we click on set tags action, and then we put comma separated tags, tag one and tag two. And as we can see, this file will have certain metadata associated with that. Next, we select all the files and we click on upload to send this information for upload. Now, once the information is uploaded, we have this check marks in the table and we can close this dialog. And as we can see, the three materials were created in the materials explorer list. And one of them has the metadata, the tags that we just created. Okay. So that's how we can upload materials information today. We support CIF and postcard formats as of right now. And users can also edit the um, crystal information in XYZ format. The next option is to import. Import materials information from an online database. So today we support materials project. And if we click on this cloud icon with an arrow in it, we'll open the import dialog. And here we can search for the material formula, for example, magnesium dioxide. And there is this quick snapshot of material information available. If you click on expand uh, this item, you, you will see the remaining information from this entry, uh, whatever material project API returns. And we can select the entry and click import for it to appear inside the materials collection. And when we open this entity, uh, we see that this is the materials viewer and it shows us the information about the crystal, crystallographic structure. Okay, so that's the second option for creating materials in the platform. The third option is to copy or import the information from materials bank. As I mentioned before, we have multiple entries that uh, have been created by our community in the bank. And we can navigate to the bank page by opening left-hand sidebar, clicking on bank and then materials. And just like in the previous demonstration, we can enter the formula for the material of interest. And then we can click on copy here at the top. And what will happen is that there will be a confirmation that the item is copied into your private collection successfully. So when we go back to the list of materials, for the account, we can see that uh, the copied item is present there. Okay, so the three ways to import, create materials information inside the account on the collection. There is also a dedicated action to import from bank, which will take users directly to the bank from their own collection. Now, in some cases, uh, people would like to 
deploy advanced search. So searching only by formula is not enough. And we support this capability too. So the advanced search can be opened by clicking on the advanced search icon. <clears throat> that looks like a, a zooming glass with an arrow. And it allows users to build their own query We're using and and or and specific keywords by which we're filtering the list. So here I'm building a query that contains formula uh, with aluminum and certain units of volume in X from Q. And I'm also adding the tag into it. So by the end, when I'm running this query and clicking search, I will see only one material because the list is now narrowed down to only the one that contains aluminum, has a certain volume of the uh, cell and has high pressure inside its size. Okay, when I click reset, I can see the whole list of all my materials. Okay. The next um, component that we'd like to speak about is the materials designer. And to open a materials designer, uh, we click on the create action, I create um, button inside the toolbar, inside materials explorer, which opens this interface. And this interface allows users to do multiple different operations that come from the header menus. Uh, but here I will just demonstrate one of it to, to show how it is supposed to work. So first of all, we open the menu dialog at, at the top. And um, in this case, we'd like to select a material from the collection that we have to, to feed the material information into this materials designer. And for that, we have to import the structure into this materials designer se session. And this import will occur from collection into a materials designer session, not from disk. It will be coming from materials collection. So when we click on import, we can now search the collection in a similar way that we did before. And when we select the item, we can see that instead of one, the default material, uh, which is silicon in this case, we have two. So silicon FCC and MP661, the one that I've just selected in the dial. Now we can remove the initial one. We can click on the trash icon. Yeah, we'll remove it. And now we only have one material to work with inside the session. Right, so this is just a quick demonstration of how to use the header menus and how to deal with the items list here in the materials designer. We'll speak more about this in uh, the advanced topic webinar. For now, let's move forward and speak about the workflows. So the workflows really are the entities that contain the logic um, is executed inside the simulation. So the first way to uh, start using the workflows is to import or copy them from the bank. As I have described, we have a community of users that have <clears throat> pre-created a certain most used density functional theory workflows, for example, uh, calculation for the form of dispersions or total energies or things like match elastic band calculations and more. So what we can do is we can navigate to the bank page and then select search for a particular calculation like the band structure. And then we can select this workflow and copy it. We copy it into the private collection and we see that it appears over here. Now the second option when dealing with workflows is to edit the logic that is included inside. And for that, we have to understand the inner structure of the workflows a little better. The workflows consist of sub workflows and units. So that there are two building blocks. Sub workflow is a set of distinct units, so primitive calculations, that are combined together in a flow chart or algorithm. And each sub workflow is specific to a single simulation engine or application as we call it, for example, VASP or Quantum Espresso. So workflows contain models like density functional theory, method, for example, pseudo potential. And subdivision on sub workflows really is introduced for modularity to be able to use some of the commonly used logic. 
So it's a workflow calculation could contain, for example, a quantum espresso self-consistent run. And then another sub-workflow will be a post-processing that is executed using Python. Unit is an elementary calculation. It is executed in succession based on the logic included inside the workflow. For example, we can deal with a convergence scenario or if-else condition, or in a more sophisticated cases, uh, things like MapReduce. And units really are uh, the elementary calculations that are executed during this flow. Units have different types as we define them. Execution, be able to run quantum espresso, for example. Assignment, where we assign a variable, A equals B. A condition, when we have a fork in the flow and such. Execution units have executables, the W.X and flavors. Flavors, for example, PW SCF. And again, this concept is introduced for modularity and for reusability. So when we come to adjust and edit the um, workflow information, we open the workflow designer interface that again contains the header menu, the items list on the left, the list of sub-workflows, and sub-workflow editor on the right. So here is a quick demonstration of how we can uh, add and remove a sub-workflow. So by clicking on the plus button here, we can append a sub-workflow, a new empty sub-workflow, and then we can cycle through the sub-workflows using the arrow buttons. So we can select the second one, or we can come back to the first one. And clicking on the minus button removes the second sub-workflow here. When we want to edit a sub-workflow, we deal with the sub-workflow editor panel. And here we have the actions menu bar, the um, editor tabs, and the units flow chart. And when we look at the units flow chart, uh, that's where the main logic contained inside this calculation, this sub-workflow really is shown. So in this progression, I'm executing a certain number of um, calculation units, starting from self-consistent field, progressing with uh, advanced calculation, and then some post-processing as quantum espresso contains. And the currently active unit box is highlighted in gray. And we have also different kinds of types shown inside this progression as E means execution. When we click on the unit, we can open its detailed view. Uh, but before we do that, let's think about the flowchart logic for a second. So here is an example of flowchart logic for a convergence workflow. So we define a variable, and then we do a calculation, and then we'll see whether the result of this calculation minus the previous result is lower than the threshold. That's the usual convergence algorithm. So that can be implemented uh, inside the workflow designer as is demonstrated on the right. I know it's difficult to uh, compare and see that the logic is really present uh, on the right. However, that's how it looks in the platform today. So there is a condition unit that makes a decision uh, on where to go next. And there are certain assignment units that assign the variables and contain uh, hold the context of this workflow. When we go and uh, open one of the units, we see detailed information about it, like the application and executable and flavor. There is a property section as well, where we can select the properties to be extracted from this calculation, like total energy, Fermi energy, pressure, and such. There is a monitor section where we can direct um, the units to extract the standard output and things like convergence. And we can see the information about which unit inside the workflow is going to be next and uh, the flow chart ID for the current unit. The input templates, the textual information that is passed to this unit is shown at the bottom. And when we speak about the templates, we, uh, we can see that there are multiple different variables available inside this template. And the reason why it is done so is because we never really uh, um, have the material information inside the workflow, as I mentioned before. However, this material information is posted 
to the workflow inside the workflow designer so that users can preview the final input files. So we have material information like it's um, structural data, like lattice and basis. And then it provides the template data that is used inside the template to render it. And so when we render the template, you can see all these variables that we have uh, defined here uh, that constitute the Pythonic or Jinja variable format. All these variables now are rendered into text. So my default material is silicon, and now I see the structural information for the silicon structure. So this is the first render that happens on the web. So this file is then posted to our computational system. And as you can see, there are still some variables that are not quite resolved. And that happens because really for the user, it, it, it doesn't matter what job working directory this file is going to go into. And that's why we substitute the job work directory on the compute cluster during the second runtime render. And this runtime render also allows us to uh, deploy certain logic during the simulations and do things like convergence that I explained in the previous slide. Okay, so now let's proceed uh, to the discussion of the calculation jobs as we understand materials and workflows. So before we create uh, one or multiple jobs, we have to make sure that we have created and uploaded the, all the desired materials information. And we have created all the necessary workflows. Workflow um, is only used in a single um, way, meaning that we can only add one workflow to a job designer. However, we can add multiple materials to make the process high throughput. We need to assert that the account has enough balance to perform these calculations and it has enough disk space. And to be able to create a job, we need to either navigate to um, a desired project, that's how we organize the jobs. So the project is simply a collection of jobs, or we can click on create job in the left-hand sidebar to use the default project. So when we do that, we are presented with the jobs designer, which looks something like this where we have the header menu again with our global actions and we have material tab, workflow tab, and compute tab. So first step uh, for us would be to select materials and here is how it can be done. We click on the, on the drop down in the header, select materials and then we can select multiple material entries from the collection, the account on collection and then click select items. When we do that, we see that the six items that we have just selected, they appear inside this materials tab and we can preview their crystal structures by circling through them. Okay, so we have six materials loaded into this job designer. And as you can see, there is also formula keyword, Jinja keyword appearing inside the name, which means that the formula for each of this material will be added, appended, to the name of the job. Because when you create six different calculations, it's handy to know which one corresponds to which material. The second step is to select a simulation workflow. And again, we start with the drop down on the top. Uh, excuse me. We start with the drop down on the top. Click select workflow and select one entry inside the workflows collection list. Now you can see this workflow appears inside the workflow design, inside the job designer. All right, so we have selected materials, we have selected the workflow. The last part is to select the computational settings, and this could be complex depending on the kind of materials and the kind of calculations that you're running. However, there are basic things like time limit, uh, the computational cluster that you want to run it the calculations queue, the number of cores, nodes, notification options, and some advanced options as well, specific to the simulation engine. So without going into the details about this, next, what we can do is to save uh, the job using the default computational parameters. So we click on the save button here in the header, and here is how we create the job. 
A couple of notes. Uh, the workflows cannot be modified during the job creation. And we did this on purpose to ensure the data consistency. Instead of modifying the workflows directly in the job creation, we suggest that users modify and edit the workflows inside the workflow designer first. And then they select the modified workflow during the job creation. That way we can see how many different specific types of workflows we have and we can assert the data consistency in the package. The unit input preview can still be edited directly inside the job designer. So for example, when there's really something that gets in your way, uh, you can modify the preview directly and put uh, the necessary information for the um, quantum espresso input to be read from there. However, we really discourage that um, again for data consistency. Multiple materials can be selected uh, either to create jobs in a high throughput way or to deal with multi-materials calculations like NEB chemical reaction studies. And jobs can also span other jobs and wait for their execution. That's a topic for advanced um, webinar. So once we have created the job, it will appear in the list um, with this blue pre-submission status. Then we can click on uh, and open the dropdown of actions for this entity and then click on run to submit this job for execution. And its status will be changed to S, submission. And after a little while, it will be changed to active when the job started execution. Okay. Now we can track the progress of the job by navigating into it. So if we click on, uh, on the job item in the list while it's active, we can see how uh, the standard output looks like. We can look at the conversions graphs and monitor and make sure that the job actually progressing in the right direction, especially for longer jobs, it's important. And finally, when the job is finished, we can navigate into it. So you can see the calculation is finished, its status turned green. We can open the job entry here and see the results of the job. So this is the band structure calculation, which also extracted multiple different other properties along the way, like the total energy, the pressure, family energy, and such. And at the bottom of it, we see the result, the band structure itself. Please note that the results are shown per unit. So PWSCF unit extracted these results. The final unit band structure bands of this workflow extracted the band structure graph. Okay, and, and this graph is interactive, so you can see um, and interact with it. The files tab contains all the files that have been generated inside the calculation, and you can download them, you can visualize them on the web as well. Okay, so that's how the results of the job, the files that are generated inside the job can be accessed. All right, I think that's um, all the content that I had for today.